Okay, welcome everybody. Um, we've been watching a silent tour of the exhibition Herman Anderson everywhere, anywhere but nowhere at the Arts Club of Chicago. And we have a big crowd today. Some of you are joining us on Zoom and then um, we're also available on YouTube for those of you who might have hit capacity on Zoom. Um, welcome to the Arts Club of Chicago Virtual Salon. I'm Janine Myleaf, the Executive Director and Chief Curator at the Arts Club. Um, please uh, write questions if you have them during the conversation in the chat or the Q&A. They're available both on YouTube and on Zoom. And also you should know that closed captioning is available for today's conversation, which will be recorded and available on the Arts Club Vimeo page in a couple of weeks. Okay. We're here today to dive deeper into the work of Hervin Anderson on the occasion of his exhibition, Anywhere But Nowhere, here at the Arts Club. For those of you who are close by, we urge you to come see it in person, and we are back to regular gallery hours, which you can find on our website. Otherwise, we're glad um, we're able to share the video tour that you just saw, and we're very excited about today's conversation. Hervin Anderson was born in England to parents of Jamaican descent. He received his art training at Wimbledon School of Art and the Royal College of Art. Exhibiting since the mid 1990s, his paintings have appeared across um, the UK, Canada, Europe, and even in Tokyo very recently. Yet this is only his third solo institutional exhibition in the United States, and we're so honored to host it. In 2017, he was nominated for the Turner Prize for his acclaimed barbershop series, and you can see some of those paintings um, in today's exhibition with a new work out of that same series. Hervin will be speaking today with Dr. Michael J. Prokopov, um, Associate Dean of the Graduate Faculty at Ontario College of Art and Design. Michael is a cultural historian and curator with a background in history and industrial design. Among his many current projects on topics like the middle class taste in mid-century North America, he has been working with Hervin on a monograph of his paintings for the past several years. Today, we have the opportunity to benefit from his deep knowledge in advance of the publication this summer. Please join me in welcoming both of them to the Arts Club Virtual Salon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Janine for that uh, very lovely introduction. And thank you to the Arts Club of Chicago for inviting uh, Mr. Anderson and me to have a conversation. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I have to say, uh, it's been a great honor over the last many months, uh, thinking deeply about uh, Mr. Anderson's work. Uh, this is a painter of profound significance, uh, whose place within uh, what can be seen as British art and the expansive art of the Atlantic uh, deserves careful uh, and thoughtful consideration. And so I'm very glad we can have this conversation today. Uh, Herman, we have had, a, we've had the, we've had the opportunity of chatting and uh, I'd like to start off our conversation with a question. And I think the question will open up uh, other contours uh, about your practice that, that we can fruitfully consider. Uh, some years ago in an interview with Alice Spalls for the Apollo magazine, September, 2016, uh, you said, uh, and I quote, it is only in painting that you can do everything you want. And I'm wondering if you would be so kind as to talk about that. Uh, to the witness. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I guess it's, I don't know, where can I start? It's, Partly my, you know, my nervousness about text and writing, and you know, you you read many things, and um, and then you know you have people who are kind of ex extraordinary dexterous with words, and maybe you think that that is the way you should uh, you should paint or. I think more importantly, I think for me, it's uh, <clears throat> um, you have many thoughts around a painting. Um, uh, you're making, <clears throat> you're thinking about painting, and it's, you know, possibly its history. Um, and I guess <clears throat> how I feel I was taught you, you you were not really supposed to discuss the 
um, maybe not the personal or the political and, and, and somehow you, you feel like painting is, has this opportunity to, you can meld these, all of these things together to, to somehow have them look, look at each other or, um, or not as, as the case may be. Um, it's, may I, may I follow up on that? Because, yeah. no, I'm interested in the fact that uh, within your educational experience and maybe it's familial experience, the idea of not talking about politics and overtly mm -hmm. political things was seen as appropriate or talking about them was seen as not appropriate. But if, if that is the case, what it means, given what you said to Ms. Spalls some years ago, that there is within painting, and I would say brilliantly in your practice, such deep ideological, political, and cultural ideas being considered. And they're being considered uh, in two ways to my mind, and, and this is the next part of my, my question. They're being considered uh, in the subject matter, overt subject matter of your works, People identify that it's a chair in a barber shop or a mirror in a barber shop wall, or it's a concrete shell on the on the beach of the Jamaican coast. But within those images, there are other messages of of deep, deep complexity that engage questions of history, British history, Atlantic history, history of what we would call the West Indies, and I use that term purposefully. Uh, and I'm I'm thinking that your paintings invite what I would call reading between the lines, which may be, a, 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 I mean, I'm trying to make a sort of a corollary between text where you can put words on a page, but in fact, there are other things going on. Any thoughts, any thoughts about that? Uh, reading in between the lines. Uh, or painting. I, I get, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's a case of whether I admit or deny, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I, I think for me, it, it's, you know, it's, uh, I, I, you know, I, 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 I'm very hesitant all the time with the way I speak because it's got all these things uh, kind of coming through my head in, in the sense of, you know, you're, in a the sense of the history of painting and in a way, as I said, politics and uh, and the personal was kind of really frowned frowned upon. You could feel the sense of you know that is not what painting is about. I mean, I remember the first day I turned up at Will Wimbledon and being told that you know it's uh, it's like uh, I wasn't in therapy. You know, it, you know this is not this is not about therapy and. Uh -huh. And yeah, but then at the same time, I kind of grew up uh, in the 70s, well, you know, 70s and, eight, in 70s and 80s. And you just, there was an atmosphere and a discussion about uh, <clears throat> uh, about black people, you know, wanting to be artists and what they should be making in a, a kind of social responsibility and and you know and wanting to somehow and then feeling that actually you know what isn't this isn't, doesn't this doesn't this medium can't this medium shouldn't this medium also be represent, representing this possibility the possibility that you um you know, it can question itself or question the, the areas <coughs> at which it's not supposed to be entering. You know, I think that I think the term "entering" is is so fitting. You know, any any work of art, two dimensional, three dimensional uh, video, uh, is an invitation to enter, and that that invitation can be taken up by anybody and that experience of entering it will vary from person to person. And I think in your practice, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna ask this question now, even though I was sort of thinking about saving it. I think in your practice, there is a, a, a profound accessibility in your work 
I mean, you make paintings that are beautiful, that are visually powerful, voluptuous, rich in palette, the subject matter of which can be seen and understood, a barbershop, a, a, a beach. And yet that entering, because it's an invitation, I think turns on the hope that people will linger and that they will see, see the beauty and take it in and be pleased by it. But they'll go past that, let's call it an aesthetic experience, uh, into, into a realm of, of demanding ideas. And when you talk about coming up in the world in the 70s and 80s in Birmingham, a city with rich cultural production, uh, a, a vibrant diasporic community and, and significant cultural contributions to the nation of Britain and beyond, there is a, a type of manifest politics in that moment in time. And your work, I think, participates in that, but it does it with such a deft of brilliance. And I'd like you to talk about the entering and subject matter, if you're willing. Um, I guess, um, where can we start? I mean, you know, once <coughs> there was one, yeah, I was, you know, always kind of wanted to be I think yeah, I'm going to maybe talk about maybe be, maybe being in Birmingham <clears throat> and around that time and uh, I, I I I think you know I feel like I, I mis misremembered it but I <clears throat> I saw the other story not when it was at the Haywood mm -hmm. it came to Wolverhampton yes and I, and I have vivid memories of going to see it twice. Um, and and going around everything being over my head, you know, and I was thinking, what am I looking at? What am I looking at? What am I looking at? And and then over time, just you realize you as time's gone on, you all the questions around uh, making art within uh, the black community. Right. What 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 does it mean? And it's there was a kind of. I fe I felt that there was. It, it was a kind of political. Um, so I, I just want to I want to interrupt you for here in case some people in the audience yes. are not familiar with the exhibition you're citing. So it's the 1989 landmark exhibition that caused remarkable conversations, some uneasy conversations. It was curated. Uh, by Rashida Reen. It started off at the Hayward. And the subtitle uh, was Asian, African, and Caribbean Artists in Post-War Britain. Yeah. Uh, and it was the first time that uh, work by diverse peoples within Britain yeah. and non-white peoples were brought together. Uh, and the force of that show, I think, still lingers. Uh, Kobina Mercer wrote about it. Any number of leading cultural theorists talked about it, Paul Gilroy. And so you're seeing it in 1989, you were a, a young person. And yeah, I, yeah. You were a young person. Yeah. yeah. And uh, in your twenties. And so that, I could think that that exhibition would have had a dramatic uh, effect on you. Um, I think it, it, I think it, yeah, it, it, it lingered. I mean, when I, when I first, the, when I started at Wimbledon, the first, the first thing I, um, the first drawing I, I made when I first got into the studio, I remember, <laughs> and I realized now it was, a, it was just a straight cut. Uh, yeah, straight, it was my take on Sonia, Sonia Boyce's Big People Talk, uh -huh. big, big People's Talk. And it was, you know, but it wasn't so much me with, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't me with my mom, it was, it was more like me, me with my dad. And it was kind of just, and um, and then, but also I I do acknowledge that you you know when you go into the personal, when you make work and there is a kind of personal element to it, it's um, there was a kind of nervousness about. Um, I, I thought it was you know 
exposing you know, my my life as well. But at the same time, it. Uh, sorry. May I ask you? I think this is an important uh, uh, issue you've raised. So. Uh, is part of it was part of your nervousness feeling that it's just not appropriate to talk about private things in public or that that the conversation about diasporic peoples the, the... I, I think i guess it's it, it was all in there i you know that was um you know i i was i was aware of all of that um, uh -huh. but at the same time um I'd gone to an art school. I was <clears throat> the only. Uh, no, that's not true. That's not true. There were other other black students uh, in there. It wasn't really a, a, a conversation. Uh, and the school had its its own ethics in in a way. You know, it was. Um, I mean, that's where the, the Col William Coldstream and Ewan Ugalu references uh, come from in, in my work and. Mm. So it in it had a not not say a profound and I think uh, at the and at this time as well uh, the Black Arts Gallery mm -hmm. uh, was still open. I didn't right. go all the time, but I I would you know I would go and see shows. Uh, I think there was the, something called a Black Marketplace that I remember going to see. And as much as um, I feel that I maybe I didn't embed myself in all the questioning around, um, but I, 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 was, I was aware of it. And I guess... Um, well, that raises, uh, that raises an interesting question. And I come back to Kobino Mercer who talks about, quote, the burden of representation that many diasporic artists have placed upon them. The idea that uh, there is this sense of duty to engage in those questions, make work that engages with historical experience. And then within that, there's the question about whether the work, and I think I will use this phrase, is overtly political. And I can think of a number of makers in the 70s and 80s who made what I would call political work. Uh, and then work that uh, is by implication about society, which is by implication about politics, but the work is not in any way directly speaking about ideology or the issues of a complex multicultural society built uh, in a land of white supremacy, colonialism and imperialism and racism. And so in that sense, I think your practice is profoundly important because you have, I would say, and do engage all of those questions that marked the em emergence of black cultural production in Britain uh, in the late 1960s, 70s, and 80s. And yet you do it, I think, in, in remarkably original and powerful ways. Um. <coughs> Sorry. I, 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 you know, going back to um, Wimbledon, uh, in a way, uh, I'm trying to, or maybe, maybe I, I bring it back more to uh, the exhibition. Um, there's, there's a lot. Of, uh, look, because there's a lot of things that I say that that is going on in the work. I, you know, I you, I've always I've always painted. I'm, I've always been fascinated by this thing of the painting and um, what it, um, you know. It's only when I went to art school, I kind of, you really understand how the possibilities and you, and you for me, painting is about a kind of, uh, it's about nuance. Mm -hmm. It's about... Uh, so when you talk you about, know, the, about the... You know, not, not, not de um, the underlying things, details, in a way, <clears throat> you know, I, things come up when you look at a painting, you, 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 you know, you understand the ground, uh, what, what, what influence a ground, putting a ground underneath a painting has in a work. And those are the things that's, 
once I got into art school, I, real, I realized, oh, these are the things I'm, I'm missing. These are the things that are important. Everything is important. And I think once I got to grips with this idea that I felt that everything was important, I felt I could actually more be, be more at ease with making, making the works that I do, discussing, so trying when, to discuss. When you're talking about painting, you're talking about the, the actual physical making of things that become painting. So the painting as an act and then painting as a consequence of an act. Uh, I, I guess I, I, I was taught you know, more about painting of, you know, the act of painting, a kind of formal without, uh, without a kind of, you know, without a kind of subject matter mm -hmm. um, approach. And the, I remember that it wasn't, it wasn't frowned upon, but it wasn't really discussed. And I guess they didn't really know how to think about it in a way. So right. it's, yeah. So then could, could at this point, we turn to the question of subject matter. I mean, more, more specifically, uh, you know, I think about the works that have been assembled for this uh, exhibition, new work you have made, uh, some of which that, uh, are focused on places in Jamaica that you have visited, which you have photographed. And then uh, some earlier works that reference the two bodies of work that looked at the uh, interior culture of uh, black or diasporic barbershops uh, in Birmingham. Uh, and what I would like to sort of talk about is how your practice, while chronologically linear, is thematically constantly interlooping that you will do work and then you'll simultaneously do other work of different themes and then you'll continue and then you will go back and then you'll move forward. And there is in the exhibition, I think the painting is called Miss Jamaica, uh, which is an abstract interior of a Hansworth barber shop that revisits work from the mid, well, mid last decade. So 15, 16. And this looping, as I call it, this temporal looping uh, which I think of your work, I just will say this quickly, I think of your work as a type of postmodern epic poem in the spirit of Walcott, where there is this powerfully sprawling set of conversations going on, and any single painting constitutes a verse in this poem, and you can read back and you can read forward, but wherever one is reading, uh, there are messages coming forth. So can you talk about how you come to subject matter? and how the process of your creativity works? Um, going, going backwards and forwards. Um, uh, uh, I think with, with the barbershops, with the security, security grills, and uh, even with these hotels at the moment, mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, that I've, within my practice, I have the phenomenon when I call the first painting, which is the one that kind of picks out this idea and think, you know, you know, what is this about? What am I doing? Does it mean anything? And then normally I, I would then go on to make um, <coughs> other works. Uh, from the uh, from that series, it's with, with the barbershops. They it was to do with what, as I said, I saw the initial space, and it it was not about a barbershop. It was a <clears throat> it was about a space within a space, two mirrors backing up on each other, and you know creating this kaleidoscope and within the space, it was like, and in a way it's, for me, it was kind of this metaphor of, <clears throat> about uh, how black people, people in the Caribbean live in this country in a way, you know, they have this one life on the surface, they hear their work, but then they have another life somewhere else, you know, whether it's, and the life here, which is supposed to be in, you know, the mother country, the 
it's supposed to be a bigger life. It's actually a smaller life in a way than the life back in the Caribbean. So, and then it was about the imagery that was in this space uh, with the security grills. Paintings you made starting, I just want to look for people yeah, who sorry. know your practice. Security grill works uh, when you went to Port of Spain with the contemporary uh, Caribbean arts and you were there uh, as a resident, as a fellow, and you were interested in the vernacular architectural forms and you started yeah. painting things that had these metal grills. So please. Uh, you know, they, <clears throat> Actually, painting a security grill is quite oppressive. Yes. I, you know, as, I, as I as I discovered, um, uh, a friend of mine came. Um, Jaime, his his cousin came from his uncle came from Venezuela, and said, "Oh, they look like they look like you you've slashed the painting, you know." And and, and there and there is a sensation mm -hmm. that you, you feel like you're you're cutting, you're, right. you're cutting you're cut cut some of these paintings and and oddly even though they're open they when you paint them they, they, somehow they feel airless it's mm -hmm. quite an odd sensation to make them and then <clears throat> so from there you um i think you would i i we went to i'd gone to india and I'd, I'd, see, I'd seen what people were doing with security grills there in the sense of they were painting them. They were, uh, they were making deities and out of metalwork and inserting them into, 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 their, into, their, into their gates. Yes. And somehow it kind of undermined these, um, <coughs> these security grills. Mm -hmm. And... S s so there was also this thing then of, you know, how can I under, how can I almost release this kind of tension within mm. this grill, this painting? So then I start, you know, I went went on to making um, um, camera shake, which is the latest thing, latest mm. paintings, and um, and some of the early tennis course painting. Paintings. Uh, there was, I think it's kind of. Uh, I'm trying to remember the titles offhand, but um, just try to pick out the light on the chicken wire. Yes. So. So those those paintings, and I think we should actually look at the images that you uh, have on on your computer to show us. Uh, it, it will be great benefit to everyone here to see your work. I, I would say that those paintings of yours that have what I'll broadly call screens, whether it's chicken wire fence or the metal security grills in a bar, are to my mind about the literal architectural, but they're also profoundly metaphoric about how we look and what we see and what it takes to see and what we have to do to see. Because when I've spent time with those works, there is something in the way the eye focuses, which is called accommodation, that you can't look at the foreground and the background of something simultaneously. You have to sort of focus on one or the other. And in doing so, there is this type of, to my mind, metaphoric statement or questioning you're putting out to the, to the world about how is anything or anybody seen? And what, what do people do in order to sort of understand? But let's, let's, let's look at these wonderful pictures. And, if you would be so kind as to talk about them, please, for everyone. Um, oh, are we in? One second, can you see? Uh, one second. Uh, right, can you see them? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so let me go back because it, I, I can, from what I, I can go from what I was saying. Okay. Uh, if I actually start for this this work, um, please. Um, <clears throat> and this, I'd made a previous um, <clears throat> uh, painting about these uh, these hotels. Um, 
Um, but then I actually, what I'd done, I'd just pretty much taken it apart and actually it, it, it was, they were in the painting really, there was only the, the, the foliage, the, uh, the plants and these the concrete kind of triangles mm -hmm. and, and the limestone. So I had kind of stripped it back to almost these kind of bare essential elements. And I think um, <clears throat> just touching on something else that is, uh, I think is in the work is this, this idea of um, the code, uh, the motif, the thing that I think is familiar to everyone. And I think that's where when the security grills came in, I think it, it was familiar, familiar to people around mm -hmm. uh, the Caribbean and, and here, and it was, fami and it was also familiar. Um, and, and people could enter into them because they seem to be a, a pattern of some kind. And, mm -hmm. and um, so then, um, so these were hotels that, um, oh, I see that they're derelict hotels that I discovered around but, um, in uh, Oshawa, just outside Arakabesa in, in Jamaica. So we'd gone to look for turtles and then up the beach were these derelict hotels. And it was a weird mix. We had to walk to look at these turtles, um, put them in the sea, we had to walk through a building site where they were building a new hotel and then further along the beach, it was this derelict things. Um, so I, <clears throat> I'd taken some, uh, some photographs, some images and hmm. I think, <clears throat> and it, I think, these are, oh, sorry. These are these are the first picture you showed us with the concrete block uh, balustrade, and then this picture of a building that is solidly concrete and being enveloped by the the, the return of nature. Uh, and you know, I think that there is so much, so much that you are. Uh, asking and and questioning in these works. I mean, these, to my mind, are critiques of the cycles of of pleasure or pl plenty and and uh, and exploitation that, in many ways, mark Caribbean history to some degree. It's about the modernist project. Places that were once sites of the enslavement of peoples are now the sites for tourists. And tourists, I always think going to paradise, have a type of pragmatic amnesia. And so your paintings raise the question, A, the tension about the natural world and the human transformed world. And then also what is, what is the Caribbean? What is Jamaica as an independent state coming out of you know, centuries of colonial and imperial exploitation? And here we have this, this dereliction that encapsulates much, so. I think there is, this is why I said that there, there, there is so much f for me in them. Um, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, there was a time when um, Jamaicans went back to, when they went back to Jamaica, they went and stayed with their family. And then in the eighties, they, they went and, well, maybe the nineties, and in the 2000s, they, they went and stayed in hotels. And so there was, there was something about that shift that there, uh, when I was making these paintings, I, you know, um, I was kind of thinking about, um, they were um, like a, a garden of, you know, a tree of good, of, good and evil, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it was like a, a garden of Eden, you know. Absolutely. I, I, 
beneath this painting is a, no, beneath the painting, sorry. Underneath the tree, there was a small waterfall that kind of trickled out. It's, it's not clear in the painting. And it just seemed to uh, add that extra element mm -hmm. of, um, and it's, for me, it was about um, adding more to the narrative of uh, the Caribbean, or it was about when I was growing up, you know, pe <coughs> there was a kind of, uh, there was a back to Africa movement and there was a movement that was about um, going back to the Caribbean. And, and somehow uh, a kind of, you know, this, I, this idea of returning or finding this perfect, perfect place, this mm -hmm. place where you can, you know, you can be free and you can retire and, you know, you're not going to be, you know, you could, yeah, there was, it was, it was this place and it was like those kinds of ideas that <coughs> were coming through. Were coming through. <laughs> I think we've got intruders. How fantastic, we have visitors, that's wonderful. <laughs> so, yeah, sorry. I know you have some other uh, pictures to show Hervin from the show. Uh, and I'm looking at the chat and uh, there's a, a fantastic question about uh, if you see the barbershop images as political. And I do want to actually return to that question in a moment, but I would like to advance this conversation about the Caribbean, Jamaican specific, but the Caribbean uh, writ large. I mean, th this picture, Higher Heights, I believe is the name of this picture in the Chicago uh, show. Is that correct? This... Uh, yes, yes, if that's right. I should and remember. you know, the, this, I find this an astonishing picture for many, many reasons. Uh, it is so distinctively yours, and yet it also, in its concrete geometric pink and blueness, disavows much of the sort of uh, voluptuous depiction of the natural world that mark a lot of your uh, pictures from the Caribbean. And I think what, what this picture does is captures as I said, these cycles of, of, of economic boom and bust that mark so many post-colonial uh, post independent nations in the Caribbean. And that, that is a separate conversation, but I do think this picture does all of that. Um, so I, I'm, I'm wondering when you made this work and we can see how it is tied thematically to the works you've shown and some of the works that were in the Tokyo show, for example, uh, would you say that this is a political work? I'll, act, I'll ask a direct question. Um, oddly, when I was when I was making it, I was actually I was thinking about um, David Hockney as a painting. I think I think it's called Time Life. Limestone Wall. This is Limestone Wall. I, I just to be correct. I apologize. Um, um, no, this this, is, this one's Higher Heights. It right. is Higher Heights. Okay, I'm correct. Okay, okay fine. The okay. one before was fine. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Um, David Hartman made a, a painting that was, uh, I think it's a time life building and it's just uh, an abstract, it's almost geometric flat painting. And then the only thing that kind of, that you know that it's a depiction of, um, a, you know, a landscape of some kind is the fact that he's, <clears throat> they, they had these palm trees um, no, there isn't any palm trees in in this, but there was this kind of kind of direct, and it, I, I guess it was. I, th I thought I thought the I thought the building was something kind of on Jamaican in a way, if I can say that. I probably in Jamaican. Uh, it, it you know. Um, hmm. you, uh, <laughs> In a way, and, and, Jamaican in a way that yes, it's it, it's a. I think it's, it was going to be a hotel, right? Uh, and it, it also re reminds me of little things you see around people building things, and then leaving, 
uh, these metal uh, metal rods that to come through the building so that at some other time when they get some money yes. they can they can they can build build again absolutely and so. and also it's i think it's it's a it, it's about me in a way in in kind of challenging not challenging but you know kind of um, yeah, maybe to challenge my own kind of precepts or mm -hmm. about the Caribbean, about this place, you know. Um, well, I think it's something it can also be modern and and brutal, you know. So, well, I, I, that's where I would like to actually go. I mean, the architecture of this structure transformed as you have depicted it and transformed it. You know, modernist poured concrete architecture coming out of the ideas of the 1930s and slightly before, which transformed the built environment of many places around the world. The idea that there was this, uh, you know, international style that was fittingly applied to a diversity of cultural places and topographical places. And so here we have this hulking pink blue ruin and it may may speak or it does speak to me about the implications of the modernist project in the context of the caribbean in the context of the atlantic expanded atlantic and globally you know the 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 utopia of modernism in in the paradise of the of the caribbean might end up in a unfinished concrete building being encroached on by plants that have been growing in that place for vast, vast eons of time. And that's quite remarkable, you know, uh, I think. Um, the, the modernist project. No, I, I look, I, <clears throat> when you're making these paintings, you're, you're, you know, you're part of me is aware. Um, of these ideas, and again, <clears throat> part of this is about the fact that, in a way, I don't really know Jamaica. I don't actually know it, you know. And then to make something like this, or to look at something like this, or to see something like this, for me, is partly kind of getting to understand that oh, this is also mm -hmm. the Caribbean. This right. is, you know, you know, I you you, you paint. Go out, so you paint lush foliage, and it's. I say it's it's seductive, you know. Uh, <clears throat> we, you know, uh, part of it. It was I was I was grown I was grown up with the idea, and a lot of our family came from the country, and and lived in the country, and they, they you know they talked about the country, and you know, and even in Jamaica, there's a kind of mythology about you know the countryman, you know. Right. Right, someone who can live off the land and live, uh, live freely, and mm -hmm. without this, without this kind of modern life. But at the same time, you know, right. you know, the, 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 the the I'm not saying it's not there, but it is also. This is so, also Jamaica as well. well. I mean, we're talking about Jamaica. I, I want to do two things. I'm aware of our time. Uh, I have one more question, a big question. But I'd like to talk about process, how you make pictures. You've acknowledged that photography is a role. You work in oil. You work in acrylic. Uh, so for this, this remarkable picture with that just fantastic blue liquidy palm tree, uh, can you tell us how this picture may have come into being in the studio as 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 a product of making, a lot of processes, material processes, and then as a set of ideas? Uh, <clears throat> it came by, um, I'd already made the painting. It's, it was, um, it, <clears throat> it, had show, it was shown, I, there's a version of it in the show that I <clears throat> had in um, Japan, in, um, at the Rat Hole Gallery. Where the tree is and, red. In that picture, if I remember correctly, red Sorry? purple. Isn't the tree in the Jap red purple? There's a kind of red purple. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> the original, the first painting was a response to a drawing that I that I, I had made, and it was 
<clears throat> a very quick drawing and um, <clears throat> but I, I, again it, it was in a way the, the paintings you're looking at they're almost a different um, they're, just, they're the same they're in the same place and I, I kind of think of them all together but whereas the one painting I thought about as being um, like a garden, <clears throat> uh, you know, a garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. This one was, I, it, I felt like it was a palace of some kind, some kind of, um, <clears throat> some kind of uh, derelict palace. And, you know, there, there are these conversations about, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, again about Black people becoming talking about being kings and queens, and you know, it's it, you know, it's a kind of uh, maybe a grassroots, just an idea to affirm oneself and to and to affirm mm -hmm. the, the history. But then, it, I, I, in a way, I, my thoughts when I was making this painting is, you know, where would they live? You know, you know, it, you know. Can you know? Can right. there be a palace in the in the Caribbean? I, I know it is, you know, the fact that it was, I know it's kind of, it looks, you know, based around a kind of derelict derelict uh, place, but the fact that it it is there is um, it was just oh. a sort. Of, it was and part of it is just to kind of almost rethink. Um, Let's not rethink the Caribbean, but you know, the, kind of put out there some of the ideas that. Well, I, I, I would say that in fact, these works do invite us to rethink the Caribbean. And I would add to that in rethinking the Caribbean, we're thinking about the expanded Atlantic. I mean, in this conversation, you said that you know, black Jamaicans who came to Britain to the mother country did so for a, a, a bigger, larger life returning home. And yet you said also that it was a a type of smaller life. And so the idea then of people going back to the homeland, whether it's the place where they were born or the place where they were raised to believe was the homeland. And I think of conversations you and I have had about, you know, you're, you're British raised in a, in a Jamaican British household and Jamaica always exists as this sort of a touchstone and not perhaps easily, easily a touchstone or easily negotiated a touchstone. I mean, I think the phrase you said was, I hope I get the wording right, you are the, the man slash young man, uh, the British boy in the Jamaican conversation. And I would say that we can take from that the question of multicultural Britain and post-imperial Britain, that all people in the expanded Atlantic are part of a conversation about the legacies of history and the things that have happened in places. And with that, I would like to go to Another question, if, if, you're, if you're willing, because uh, yeah. again, I'm aware of time and I know we have uh, uh, people uh, who are here who would like to ask questions. So I'm reminded in looking at your work uh, of scenes of Jamaica or Trinidad or the melding of both, uh, of the work of the poet Aishion Hutchinson, who is a professor at Cornell, who uh, I believe was uh, born on the North Coast of uh, Jamaica. And, he speaks about the Caribbean with, with great insight and power. And he talks about, quote, the tragedy of the landscape. Uh, and he says, momentarily, you can forget the horror that this field is a field drenched in blood. He said, in fact, going around the Caribbean, any of the islands, you end up somewhere so beautiful that the marks of history are not evident immediately. And I think that you understand that in, powerful ways and you make pictures that take one in because of the richness of the way you use paint and the composition and, and all of the atmosphere that is achieved through painting because it is, as you said, the thing by which you can do everything you want. But I am interested in, in that powerful ideological comment from Hutchinson that applies to your practice. Um. <laughs> And it's about beauty, actually. The question's about beauty. Um, I mean, it's it's a big question, and I'm I'm not sure. 
yes, I, for sure. I definitely understand um, the, the history of the, oh, I think, yeah. You can understand the history of the Caribbean and the horrors that have, you know, have, have befallen it. Uh, whether I, I'm not sure if I am, you know, <coughs> you know, I, I, I guess I would, I would, be, I would be making more, more paintings like "Is it okay to be black?" If I felt I truly took on a lot on the, of those subjects, I feel like I, I touch on them. Um, I'm not sure if I am. Um, Equipped because I, I often I, I feel like those subjects are so <clears throat> emotive and so this is almost I'm not sure if this is the place to um, you know you, the place to take them on because they they somehow they I, I mean know. I I have to, I do respect you you are the maker of these works so I respect what you say <laughs> I'm all but I'm also gonna as a person who I suppose has a, the opportunity to think about your work, disagree with you slightly, because I think in fact, you do take these issues on fully. I think you do it in a way, and this is, this is the power of your practice in a way that a lot of people who might not spend the time thinking about the implications of what they're seeing because they see beauty and because they see palm trees and they might see interiors of barbershops with mirrors that are visually transfixing. They might not think about, well, how do we get here? What are, what are these things as the legacies of things? And so I think that you are a painter, a British painter trained in distinguished art schools in traditions of landscape painting, who then, take, who then takes those skills of landscape painting and expands it to the Caribbean, where there's a long history of British landscape painters who went to the Caribbean to paint plantations and pens and render the violences of those places palatable to a type of gentrified audience back in the metropolitan center, all of that circulates in your practice and invites viewers to say, oh, what do I think about this painting? What am I actually seeing in this painting? What are the implications of this painting? And there's no checklist about whether the viewer has to say, well, I got six out of 10 or three out of 10 or 10 out of 10, but I think your, your critical insights and your brilliance as a practitioner embed each one of your works with these powerful commentaries about the expanded Atlantic, Black modernity, post-colonial life, contemporary society. Uh, that was a lot, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, 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 it's um, contemporary society. Uh, yeah, I... I I just I go I go back to, you know this um, <clears throat> this idea that often I think I feel like I when I'm am amongst uh, people from the Caribbean and you talk you know you talk to people you, f you feel like there's a kind of a lot there's a bigger picture and you feel like there is kind of uh, another possibility. And I've just been trying to kind of just look at what, what that could mean, you know, or is, it, is there a possible possibility to, you know, to use a palm tree or paint a palm tree, right. use a palm, put a palm tree in a painting <clears throat> and all, all of a sudden I'm, I'm not, um, and it does, People on us go, ah, oh, it's just a palm tree, and you know, <clears throat> to, to give it more, give it something else than just a seductive quality, you know. Um, uh, yeah. Well, I, I hope I, I have answered these questions. So. No, no, that was that was a, a, a superb a superb uh, answer. I I, I I I I am interested in the question of beauty, and if. You know, I know, I know from our conversations over the years, uh, you, as a, young, as a young boy, got your brother's camera, took pictures, drew all the time in school. Your teachers talked about you being just constantly drawing these, these worlds, imaginary worlds, that you went to look at art, art in Birmingham, and then you would get on the bus 
from Birmingham and go to London and go to all the galleries and go to the shows. Uh, and so I'm, I'm wondering if as a maker who is so an astute observer of, of the world, things around one, uh, if, if you are interested in the concept of beauty as, as, a, as an aesthetic or philosophical principle or, or motivator. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, that, that is a big question. And- uh, Gotta end on a big note, Herman. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I'm not really, you know, uh, I'm not thinking about beauty at all when I'm, uh -huh. but when I'm making them. I'm thinking about r rendering, you know, you know, uh, you, you, you put, you, uh, I'm looking at the at the leaves uh -huh. at the top of these paintings, and you know, and I kept thinking that how much, how much do I have to put in, put into to, to this? Do, do I have? To, is it going to be? How do you, how do you de depict a palm tree leaf? Because in one way, they you know you you, you see the picture; it's very graphic very clear, very sharp. And there's an, another de depiction that is almost quick. And and, it, and I wanted to find somewhere where it was both something and and nothing at the same time. It, it, it was just it was like an umbrella, nothing. shade. Anywhere you know? and nowhere, something and nothing oh, anywhere no. and nowhere. You know. Um, well, you know, I, 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 think, I think within your work, there, there is a, a line that you are, about which you were constantly aware, about the potential to document something, whether it's the verisimilitude of taking a photograph and making a painting from it, or document a mood or a feeling or an idea or a set of circumstances or, or, or the realities of a community or a place or a nation. And in that process, you make works that are suggestively realistic, they're, they're, they're identifiable and believable, but they also go to another place. And, and I do think that in many ways, your, your works of the Caribbean have this enveloping capacity. They are, they're two dimensional, but they're immersive. And it may well be uh, that that's, I mean, that's testament to your, your abilities as a painter, but you know, they, they, draw, they draw viewers in and then once in, the question is, what do we, what do, we do with that? And I think that's, that's where your significance as a maker is so important. You know, we're almost, we're almost at the end of this conversation and I know that there are people who would like to ask questions. So I think at this stage, I'm gonna turn it back to uh, Janine and uh, our colleagues at the Arts Club to see where we stand. So uh, thank you, Herbin, very, very much for taking the time thank to share it. Janine, please. And, uh... Thank you both so much. Um, I don't want to, um, I just want to point us to some of the questions that we've had from the audience. And Herman, I think people want to know a little bit more about how you work with washes. I won't, um, there's, this is better worded in the chat, but how do you work with photography? How do you work with tape and grids and washes and layers and vellum and all those things? If you could speak a little bit, Herman, about that. Um, which one first? Um, <coughs> the grid, um, the grid and the photograph kind of go together uh, in a way is, <coughs> I was making, I used to use the grid, uh, <coughs> I used to project paintings and every time you projected something, I could see there was a particular drawing that would come out of a projector. So uh, hence I went back to this idea of <coughs> scaling things up using, using the grid and which then linked to the grills in a way once you, <coughs> once you, lay, a, once you lay the grid onto the painting it seemed to um, when I say emphasize the surface, I mean, emphasize the picture plane, 
<clears throat> you know, the, the thin surface of, of which the painting kind of just hangs on. Um, it seemed to emphasize that. And so it, in some of the paintings, it, it's, it's kind of stayed, kind of, um, <clears throat> the photograph is, you know, it's, it, you know, I, I, I say I, I have a love-hate relationship with photograph. It's, it's both interesting, it's kind of this document or, you know, I can take away with me. Um, my, <clears throat> uh, my brother-in-law died now, He's, he, he said, you, you, it's like you want to take away Jamaica with you. You know, you're, you're crazy taking all these pictures. And there was this element of that, you know, that's the only way um, I could take, but at the same time, once you're here, it's, you, you start to find out the limitations of the photograph, you know, it's, that's it, that's all you have. You, you work with that. And um, it, it is, it is funny, you, you, you start to realize how much the interesting about working from, working from something from life. And then you start to realize, oh, when you work from something from life, the, diff the, the other questions that kind of, um, that come up. And, um, I'm, I'm straining us slightly into another project, but yeah. Um, the, the, the vellum was, uh, we, we call it drafting film here. Um, I, I did quite enjoy the way it's, the paint would exist on the surface. Uh, and I also enjoyed the fact that I could, I could paint on the back, the back of it as well. Um, you, you know, you <clears throat> sometimes I'd make a uh, make a drawing or uh, trace something off or paint something, and then from there you can find I could, I could extend out. I could could make enlarge enlarge the work um, with the vellum. So hence that was, and I think it's. I think it it allows like a kind of flexibility. Uh, I you know I if you <clears throat> I'm slightly irreverent with I try to be irreverent with the drawings. I I have them here. I scan them. I I enlarge them, and um, perhaps all the things you're not supposed to do with a drawing, uh, and you know I. I play with those things. Um, in a way, it's, it's it's about getting into the photograph or getting into the image or s stopping the photograph from being that thing or stop, stop it registering to the viewer that this has come directly from a photograph. And now it is um, a painting. Uh, or it wants to be a painting. Well, um, um, there's a question from Emmanuel, and maybe I'm just going to summarize it. But you know, he's asking about the the tension between the the burden of representation um, and the politicizing of representational representational patient painting. I think particularly by Black artists, and then abstraction. And I know in this exhibition that you were thinking very deeply about abstraction versus representation. Um, and maybe you could talk about, he asks if that's a, if you would invest in the material processes and abstraction inherent in the painting, perhaps as a way to get away from the political. Um, <sighs> yeah, you know, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I slow down because of a number of ways. Um, Part of it, it part of, I should say, part of it is just it's just painting. You know, you're kind of interesting, interested, interested in this <clears throat> this idea of um, your 
<clears throat> you're making pic. You're, you know, it's it it's it is a a picture, you know. Um, but at the same time, you're trying to remind just your, not remind yourself. Um, I think part of me is it's, it's about a, a freedom as well. You know, there would I mean maybe going back to a little bit what um, Michael would. Prokopo was talking about was the, the burden of representation. And, but I think a, a lot of discussion, um, I think something that underlines it for me is that a kind of lack of freedom, because even within the quest, even within when you're making paint, you know, within the black community, is it politically enough? Is, you know, uh, are you representing? But also at the same time, you want a freedom to explore, you know, uh, other subjects or, you know, this this idea of the paint and how, how it interacts or doesn't interact with um, <clears throat> uh, one thing interacting uh, with another and, you know, the history of painting and, you know, whatever that may be. So, um, at that point, Herb, and there's fantastic comments. I was just going to say that there's a comment from uh, Danny who says, uh, you have a vibrant balance between preserving the phenomenon of a place's history while resisting the historicization of the art project. And then another comment says, it's just about the freedom and I think, which then is, I think for all of us, the joy of looking at the works you make. But then, uh, but then there is, you know, <laughs> you know, you, you can, it can be, batted back you know uh, in the sense of you know should one be you know you know back to burning representation should one be enjoying oneself in a sense you know is that the purpose of this or you know um yeah no it's it's a thing that's um it's it's both fascinating and uh disruptive in a way is how to find the balance if you can ever find the balance between these ideas you know I, I, I guess I felt as though when I was coming through art school it was kind of frowned upon to discuss but whereas uh, any kind of politics and and I guess it's it's a little bit about still um, that conversations in my head you know, there's a kind of balance of how do you meld these two two things together? Should they be melded together? Um, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I don't want to destroy the essence of something and let it become easier for a viewer to take on, in a way. Uh, Urban, I, I know we're, we're a little over time and I, I know okay, people have sorry. to go, but I want to ask you a final question to go out on. Will you talk to us about the title of the exhibition? Um, anywhere, well, as I said, it's come from the, the um, KC. White. Uh, I, should always, I should know his name off by heart. KC White. Um, and... Uh, I think at the time I was just looking, thinking about the, the, what, the type, uh, what the title of the exhibition should be. And it was really hard to kind of um, come up. And I, I had, uh, I have a, this, um, I forgot what the LP is called now, but uh, Screaming Target. I forgot, I forgot the name of the artist, uh, the name of the, <clears throat> but the, the the track came. It starts off um, <clears throat> with anywhere but no one, it, and it seemed to just sum up the kind of not the the, the mood um, <clears throat> of of the paintings, and and I, and I guess it, I'm, I'm kind of attracted to a kind of no man's land, and it, in between space. Um, and it seemed to sum up this. Um, <clears throat> uh, Claudette, Claudette Johnson, our friend, says that it's a big youth screaming target. 
It's so, speed. That's right. Yeah. Bye. Another brilliant yeah. painter. <coughs> thank you, Hervin, so much. I'm going to say thank you for the opportunity to chat. And thank you, Janine, for your uh, superb curatorial work. And thank you to the Arts Club for this opportunity to talk about amazing paintings and an amazing artist. Hervin, it was a real honor. And thank you for- Thank you. Um, sorry, my screen has gone all strange anyway. Um, thank you. I, I hope that's, uh, I was able to answer questions. Um, it's a little bit strange doing it from this. I, I, I would like to say before I go to Janine and the staff, because normally I would have an opportunity to be there and say thank you and, you know, have a drink or do something, you know, but, um, we didn't, so you know. Yeah. I'd like to take <laughs> so I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you uh, for putting the show on, and thank you for giving the opportunity and to the staff for putting everything together. Uh, that was, you know, you know, thank you. And, and Irvin, I'm going to take a time. rain check on that toast. <laughs> and okay. also tell people if you come to the show, there's a beautiful brochure with an, S X, an essay by Krista Thompson, scholar of the Caribbean. And um, if you want to, if you can't come in person, you can get it online. And it's really beautiful, very beautifully printed by Fata Morgana Press. So that's your incentive to come see it in person. And thank you both. <laughs> and I really don't want to say goodbye because it's been such a joy listening to you. But okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sorry. Bye. Bye now.